Welcome everybody to our weekly moose art class that has had a couple of breaks. <laughs> um, my apologies for not having class last week. My um, computer, which I use for my job, as well as for my personal life, um, got smashed at my job. So it took me a minute to get my new computer. Baruch Hashem God, um, was able to make that happen for me. And so here we are again, pursuing um, Musar class <laughs> online. So refresh. The book we're doing is It's All the Thing to Me by Rabbi Moshe Gerst. And we're going to be aiming to stay within the, was it 45 minute timeline that Zoom gives us tonight. So we might not make it all the way through the first chapter, but we will definitely give it a try. Hearty hailed try. All right. So let me see. Go ahead and share my screen with everyone. All right. So last week, <clears throat> the question was, what is, what is the point of it all? Right. I believe his, his question was, um, pretty poignant, just right out there. What's it all about? Okay. And chapter one, he answers that question, says the answer is love. Yay, love. Okay, but it's not just love. It's also you. It's up underneath and inside. The answer is something beyond your analytical thinking mind and has more to do with your essence, or you might want to call your essence like your soul, than your present experience. Um. And I, I use this picture that looks a little bit more Kabbalistic in, in nature because really, you know, we're taught by our, you know, the Kabbalists that um, the part of your soul that is in this body is the smallest part. The most immature part is what the last book that we uh, studied taught us. So let's talk about, um, do we miss? Okay. Um, Kasha. Kasha is the Aramaic word for question, and Kasha shares the same root as the word for straw, which is kash. And straw is the stalk that grain grows on, but in and of itself has no nutritional value. Um, and and our other says so. You got to imagine uh, being able to eat straw and not have warm, nourishing bread. Nobody would really like that except for maybe a cow. Um, but he says that when we get stuck on our questions, it's like we're getting stuck in that stock. We haven't quite hit the grain where we're being nourished. We're just kind of stuck in the middle of our questions. And he says, so let's start being able to address our questions without getting stuck in the stock. And we need to trade in our questions of pain for the answer of love. What questions most often is why? Why me? Why this? Why now? Why do I have the flat tire? Why am I late for work? Why is this person shouting at me? Uh, why won't Why won't this stop? When will it be over? Those are the kinds of questions that inevitably end up making it harder, making it more painful. We have to be un able to understand um, the underlying emotions of our struggle is this question of why. Behind the question is a judgment about life situation, which creates a negative charge and a resistance. But we're supposed to judge, right? I mean, we need to be able to decide if this person who's going to work on my house is a good you know, good enough at his trade that I can trust him to do it. Or we need to be able to determine is this person that I'm considering for, you know, to be a spouse, um, somebody I can be compatible with, or, you know, is this, um, toothpaste, the good, a good enough quality. I mean, those are the kind of things that we actually do need to judge, right? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the kind of judgment that's like, why is my life like this? It's not supposed to be this way. And he says that it's this, um, this kind of question is that judgment about a life situation, which creates a negative charge or a resistance. 
And it's this negative charge or resistance that actually causes pain. We assume that none of these things should be happening, but that's not right either. You know, this is, it, it's a normal thing to have those thoughts and those questions, but it is important for us to be able to judge. While it's important for, for us to be able to judge, judge the quality of something, or like I said, you know, is this person a good spouse or a proper employee for the job? The thing is, is that we aren't supposed to carry that analytical thought into why is this happening to me? It, it needs to be more of something else. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so negativity. Again, we're going to talk about this real, real quick. Problems arise when we turn our assessments into a story that creates pain. In other words, when we dramatize our life situation, we mentally and sometimes verbally write in, in uh, a dramatic narrative that concretizes our pain and perpetuates the unrest that we experience. I don't know about you guys. I would assume everybody's met this kind of person in their life where every time you encounter them, it's like all of the stories of their life sound like a soap opera. And I want to give you a little bit of an insight here. It's not just those people. <laughs> we do it too. <laughs> Everybody does it. We look at what's going on around us and go, it's not supposed to be this way. Um, we should be living in the moment, not in the past where we're where we relive the glory days or continue continue to beat ourselves up over things that we did in the past. And we shouldn't be living in the future, which we have no control over, right? We should be living in the moment. And this pain is a negative energy that moves you further away from happiness, truth, love, and really God. So let's talk about that. Um, pain is a negative energy. Um, we've just said that, but it's also a negativity. So maybe you're not having a whole lot of emotional connection, but you're still looking at it in a negative way. Um, this is the same energy that starts every war from small arguments to genocides and the Holocaust throughout history. All negativity comes from the same place and the same source. Where does this pain come from? The drama in our lives is created through the way that we experience whatever happens to us, the way we judge what people say to us, the judgments that we make about ourselves, the way we perceive all the situations and conditions we find ourselves in. It's not, I, I want you guys to look at the pictures that I chose here. And the reason I, I picked these pictures is because this is about perception, right? So with the sunglasses, you can see the reflection of the sunglasses of the surroundings um, are lush and beautiful. But what the sunglasses um, look to be sitting on looks like a desert wasteland, right? Um, you got the two guys down here on the bottom. One guy says it's six. The other says it's nine. Well, they're both right because it's from their perspective, right? And then you have the picture um, here that either you see a young maid or an old hag. You know, it just depends on, on where, where your eyes are focusing. See, the situation that creates, it's not the situation that creates the person. It's not the feelings within the person either. Rather, it's the way we view life that causes our sense of situation, our sense of the situation that we encounter. So the thing about that is, is, is we can either, <laughs> you're right, Azariah, that is quite the nose. <laughs> um, the, the thing is, is that you can choose what, how am I going to, how am I going to see this? You know, with one of my clients that I work with, one of our um, ways of modifying behavior with this person, one person is when they start becoming upset and crying, 
we ask why they are feeling upset and then we hear what they're having to say and flip the perspective because this person doesn't know how to do that. You know, so we flip that perspective from focusing on the negative to focusing on the positive. So if they're crying because something's hard, I'm like, yeah, but you did it. You succeeded. Or if they're um, upset because they don't know where we're going to go, we help them ask, where are we going kind of thing. And um, <laughs> everybody's laughing because of the nose. Does it, don't you guys see the young maiden? The maiden is really pretty. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that being able to flip that perspective is a huge thing. And a lot of times we get so bogged down with our emotions of what's going on around us that we can't even see that silver lining around the cloud. We can't see anything positive from the situation. What's positive about, I don't know, losing your job or, um, the Holocaust. What was positive about the Holocaust? Anybody can answer that one. We got the we got the land of Israel back. It was a huge positive to come out of that. It took a lot of sacrifice, but it was a huge positive to come out of that. The thing is, is that we it's all about how we view it. And that's the big thing. So how you see is more important than what you see. So in this picture, you can see that there's a storm, but if you zip it back, then there's a bright sunny sky, right? Um, you have many, um, you may have questions about this point about abject good and negative situations. Our author will get to that later on. Um, this is just chapter one. <laughs> so, um, you know, we will talk about that later because, you know, I'm pretty sure everybody's sitting there thinking, well, what about tragedy? Yeah, we'll get to that. For right now, at this moment, let's just understand the concept that we have to understand our perception of things and what we're going to choose to focus on has so much to do with what we're going to be learning. Um, in the meantime, we will focus on whether there is another way of looking at things. So hishtavus. Hishtavus is related to the word shave, which literally means it's the same. Thus, the meaning sameness, oneness, or equanimity. Hishavus is a state of non judgmental awareness. It is when you can totally accept reality as it is without labeling th things as essentially better or worse. And it's the beginning of what it means to live in the presence of God. I chose this picture um, of this frozen wilderness because this is, in my mind, a very good example of his Is this picture? You can feel how cold it is in that in that picture in that setting, but at the same time, it is so beautiful. It, it, I mean, it, it looks it look like God had fun with paints that day. I mean the the, the sunset is gorgeous, right? But you know, looking at that picture, that it has got to be so cold and very unforgiving. The person taking the picture might have come home with some frostbite or chapped lips or something. But look at that. You've got those two very competing, um, you know, harsh reality of things and yet the beauty all around it. And it's all one. So the Baal Shem Tov said that sameness is being as sameness as being fundamental principle upon which all of spiritual development rests. Sameness is the fundamental principle upon which all spiritual development rests. I think if you think about that for a minute, that should give you an idea of how big this is this is huge okay um batya ibn pakura the author of duties of the heart states that hishtavus is the most important spiritual practice and quality one can attain that's huge i mean he's the guy who 
in many ways is the father of Musar. The, the, the books, the duties of the heart is like one of the foundational um, sets of books on, on the whole study of Musar and his whole thing. He said that Hishtavus was the most important spiritual practice. So that's huge. Why is Hishtavus so important? You can live in harmony with all of life and enter into a conscious alignment with a higher order. Think about that for a minute. How can you be in harmony with all of life? That includes good and bad. That includes convenient and inconvenient. That includes, you know, I don't know, lovely things as well as not so lovely things. Um, this state of allowing and surrender opens up a space inside of you that engenders reward, creativity, connection, and the experience of love to expand. I mean, that sounds like it's enormous. It sounds huge, right? Seeing life through this lens of oneness uh, lets you see the good and love laced within it. It's, it kind of makes me think of that saying that people used to say back in the day of, oh, yeah, you're just looking at things through rose-colored glasses. Well, maybe not rose-colored, but definitely colored by um, Hishtabus, right? Okay, so that's why most Jews look alike. We <laughs> are all the same because our spiritual growth is based on Hashem, which is unchanging. I love that, Azariah. I love that. Um, okay. So the fundamental idea in living a spiritual life is saneness. So, whoa, wait a minute. The fundamental idea of living a spiritual idea is saneness. I don't know about you guys, but until I read this author, I was like, I never heard that before. <laughs> I learned, I've learned a lot. So this is such a huge concept. This is such a huge understanding. This is such a fundamental idea. Why is it nobody else is talking about it? Why is it that nobody else is, they talk around it? I don't know. This is, is, is puzzling to me, but let's keep going. So there are seven qualities that are related to sameness. Harmony, alignment with a higher order, love recognition, allowing surrender, space, and a lens of oneness. And now let's talk about all of those seven things. Hishavos is living in harmony with all of life. Life is happening and stops for no one. It has been said that God is life in action. I love that. God is life in action. When Moshe asked Hashem who he should tell the people sent him, Hashem answers by saying, I am that I am, or I will be who I will be. Well, if God is life in action, then likewise, things are that they are. They will be as they will be. And to live in denial of that truth is to deny the presence of God. To live in harmony with this truth is to live in the presence of God. So wait a minute, let's slow our roll for just a second. If I'm supposed to live in harmony with life will be what it will be, well, what do I do when I lose a job? How am I supposed to be in harmony with losing a job, right? And that's why I like the picture that I chose here. You got a surfer on the waves. And if you think about it like this, if you think about the waves is being life, the ocean's being life, right? The surfer can choose to um, ride the wave. He can choose to stand firm and let the wave crash down on him, or they can choose to not stand firm. And when the wave crashes down on them, they, they go under, right? There's not many more choices the surfer can make. So you're going to either ride it, stand firm in the midst of it, or be pulled under. And in my mind, the person who is living in harmony with this truth is either riding the wave or at least standing firm. 
But how many times do things happen in our life and we're not standing firm and we're not riding the wave, we're actually getting pulled under and hopefully not getting caught by the undertow, but getting, we're getting knocked down, the water's going up your nose, <clears throat> not fun feeling. The point is, is that learning how to change your perspective and kind of like the book we did last, last time, um, the You Revealed book, where he talks about being able to stand back and look at your thoughts. Well, this is talking about being able to stand back and see what's going on around you and see that it's all part of the same thing. Hashem has allowed it all. And where does my choice point live? Uh, live? Is my choice point live out there with everything going on? Or does my cho choice point live within where I can look and analyze things regardless of my emotional state at the moment, right? Let's keep going. Hishtavos is to enter conscious alignment with a higher order. So there is a deeper intention behind everything that occurs. Right off the bat, he's hitting hard. Um, nothing ends with what we see on the surface. And that's the hugest thing. What we actually physically see, what we can touch, what we can smell, what we can hear, these are all concrete. Hashem is beyond concrete. He is the most abstract that anything could be. He didn't even have a body, right? So if God doesn't have a body and he's the most abstract, then why do we keep trying to put him into a physical box? We need to learn how to make a space within us for Hashem, just like he's made a space for us within himself. And in the most physical, concrete, real sense, that's what we did when we had the temple, right? But we don't have the temple right now. And it's almost kind of like Hashem saying, no, I want you to learn how to make that space within who you are. Just like he made that space for us within who he is. There is always more going on behind the scenes. You do not know all of the variables that go on in one person's life. You don't even know all the variables that go on in your own life. And that's, I think, why we're in, um, encouraged to not judge someone else. Because you don't know. You don't know what their life has been, what their life is going on right now, and what their life will be. And that's why we can only really truly work on our who we are, right? The creator, the sustainer, and director of life, as it unfolds, has intentions of the highest good and love. That right there encapsulates pretty much all of faith. To believe that Hashem is allowing what he is allowing in your life, not for any other reason than good and love, even though these things are hard and frustrating and not what we think they're supposed to be. Or disappointing on some level. We only see a small fraction of reality. And if you guys remember from the last book, when he talked about how it's like a spoke of a wheel and you got the very center with all the spokes going out and the radius that they go out makes this much larger wheel. And if you were to move that spoke, even a small amount here would move a whole lot further out above on that wheel, right? In the same way that we can only see that little small step that we take down here, Hashem sees the whole thing and he knows what he's doing. And that's where this bit of coon has to come in, where we trust him, right? Living with equanimity, you will find a hidden harmony, uh, a sacredness, a higher order in which the knowing and the known and the knower are all one. Think about that for a minute. That's intense. Pishtavus is a fertile ground for wisdom and freedom and a space for compassion and love. And there is an ease within when we see the bigger picture. It is being able to hold space for unlimited potential 
an infinite possibility, an inner knowing that all things lead in the right direction, whether or not it unfolds according to how we think it should. That's huge. I put this picture of two sets of footprints on the beach because this whole concept here, this, this being able to enter uh, conscious alignment with a higher order, this whole concept makes me think of Enoch. And all the Torah says about Enoch is he walked with God for 300 years and he was no more. It does not say he died. It says he was no more. Think about that for a minute. He must have had so much hishtabos that it's like God was like, what else can I possibly teach you? It's amazing to me. Something I desperately want to grasp onto. Hishtabos is recognizing that uh, the love that exists everywhere. The energy of all things. Uh oh, we are running out of time. No, I'm not going to upgrade right now. Okay. So guys, we might have to call this the end here. We're going to do this last slide and then we'll have to pick back up next week. The energy of all things, the events that are flooded with a loving presence of the creator, despite their own outer appearance, is seeing that inside rather than just focusing on the, on the obvious outside. It's a possible um, and it's, it's possible to literally feel the connection between you and all of the rest of creation. All is a part of the love story being told by God. And love is the epicenter of creation. So thank you for <laughs> stop, uh, stopping in for class this week. We will definitely, um, oh, somebody's trying to say something. Oh, thanks, Azariah. We will definitely pick up on this slide, uh, starting with this slide next week. And hopefully we will have a better situation going for our Zoom next week. But thank you so much for joining us. And I can't wait to see you guys um, next week. Uh, let me stop the sharing and...